Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, congratulations, leaders read and led better. Also, A.G. Marshall wants to prosecute women. And the new chairman of Military and Veterans Affairs is a strange guy. For the next hour, sit quietly and we will control all that you see and hear. Beware the blue viper. <laughs> all this and much, much more coming up next on The V. Welcome to the voice of Alabama politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and today I'm joined by Susan Britt, research guru extraordinaire, and Josh Moon, columnist and investigative reporter for APR. Welcome. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Well, we had another big week down in Montgomery. Uh, the legislature had its organizational session and uh, no surprise here, but uh, Nathaniel Ledbetter was elected Speaker of the House. Just Wish barely, though. Lucky. Just barely. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, what was the total on total that? Total there, Josh, sorry, was 102 to 0. It was <laughs> unanimous. Yeah, unanimous. Uh, and I think it's interesting, you know, he did win unanimously. Uh, that's not the first time that's happened. But it's the first time it's happened, uh, uh, you know, where we kind of look at things a little differently now than we did during the Hubbard days mm -hmm. when you saw a unanimous vote. It didn't mean that they wanted Hubbard. It just means they were afraid not to have it. Uh, but Josh, uh, minority leader, Anthony Daniels, had some good things to say about the vote and his working relationship with Nathaniel Ledbetter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think... Um I think Democrats were were fairly pleased. Of course, they're in the super minority uh, on this, and so they're essentially looking for someone who is willing to work with them, uh, who will be fair to them. Uh, and and I believe over the course of the last several years and dealing with Nathaniel Ledbetter, they believe that uh, believe him to be a fair minded uh, person. That's not, you know, that I don't think anybody out there would put him in the crazy camp. Uh, that you know, they say that he's uh, ideologically just off the ledge. Uh, so I, you know, I think that this was a good, solid person that they feel like they can work with, and they feel that way because of the way he's behaved with them in the past and built up some trust. Well, well and and two, he also said that he plans to use the gavel as a tool and not a weapon, and I think that goes very far in, in saying what kind of person he is, how he's going to lead and what his intentions are here. And it sounds to me like everybody's pretty encouraged. Well, I, I know he has a good working relationship with Governor Ivey's office. I know he has a good working relationship with uh, Senate President Pro Tem uh, Greg Reed. And, and he has a lot of support among the business community, which is always good. I think he made a couple of really smart decisions uh, in changing some of the rules mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. One of the big ones, Josh, and you can speak to this, uh, is that before, if you had a local bill or a local CA, any one of the 105 members could voice uh, that he, he didn't support it or she didn't support it, and that bill would not go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, you, if you are against a local bill, it takes another 10 House members to hold it up at any length. Yeah, I think that that is a uh, that's a good change uh, in my mind, uh, simply because we sh we should have more uh, you know home rule. Uh, we should have we should be able to uh, our counties and county delegations should have more authority to implement basic laws uh, that they want to implement in their counties, and uh, without the rest of the legislature sticking their nose into this. Uh, you know, we, we've had this problem in the past where there would be uh, bills or things that would come up. Uh, usually, at least most recently, usually these were in the more Democratic-leaning counties uh, yeah. with black lawmakers that were presenting bills that were beneficial to their constituency. Uh, and somewhere down the line, somebody would step in uh, and, and throw, uh, throw a wrench into the whole thing and force the whole bill to be brought before the legislature and, and, and a full vote. 
which is you know something I, I just feel like it's a it's an intrusion on that county where listen there are times where there needs to be a check and a balance I think on this and I think up in that number of people who are concerned about a bill uh, to a level 10 or higher is probably a good step to go yeah but also and remember we've seen it where one or two legislature leaders get and get their feelings hurt they don't get something they want and they go mm-hmm. in and just torpedo all these other bills for no other reason than just for spite yeah, yeah. and it keeps these legislators from being able to and you know help and enable their communities to do the things they need just because somebody got their feelings up. I, I think another yeah. interesting rules change was to put more power back into the hands of the committee mm-hmm. I know mm-hmm. when they wrote the rules in 2011 or 2010 for yeah. that that session coming in 2011 they they basically took a lot of power away from the committees mm-hmm. and the reason for that was when the 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 bill was brought to the floor Mike Hubbard who was then the speaker wanted to be able to change all the bills to suit him right. on the floor the this new rule will allow the bills to come forward more intact with less intrusion exactly. uh, from the speaker. It, in other words, that. amendments that are put on in committee will stay on without having to go through the microscope yeah. of the speaker. Right, right. I, I think that's very positive, very positive change. Uh, Greg Reed, of course, was uh, unanimously reelected as president pro tem. And, uh, no surprise there. Uh, no surprise there. And I think, uh, Josh, and I, we probably shouldn't say this too often, but... This gives us two reasonable leaders in the House, in mm-hmm. the Senate. It also gives us a reasonable leader in the governor's mansion. Mm-hmm. And I think this bodes well for the state going forward, especially with all the challenges we have, education, prisons, uh, I would dare say, uh, 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 you know, still infrastructure developing of business. And those three have a really good working relationship going into this, uh, at least at this point. So it, 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 we should get off to a good kickoff here. Yeah, let's hope so. Uh, but again, I know it's not what you would want, Josh, but I think, <laughs> you know, those of us in the far middle are very yeah. happy with this. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, uh, you're right. I would, you know, I would obviously like for there to be uh, more Democrats in leadership and more Democrats in, in government uh, just overall, uh, just because I think it, it would create a much better balance. But that said, uh, you know, my other wish is for, uh, is for us to have people who are reasonable, who will go in and compromise and work um, and, and, and try to come to some consensus agreement on government and do things that help the people of the state. I mean, ultimately, that's what I want. I don't really care about the name beside or the letter beside your name. I really care more about the, the, the policies that you're putting forth and the people that you're helping. And if that's what they're out there doing, then, then I don't really care if it's a Republican or a Democrat. Right. And, and the, the job that's going to face both Speaker Ledbetter and President Pro Tem Greg Reed is going to be to tamp down on the crazies. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. going to be a big job. Yeah. I've been trying right. that for years. <laughs> so we, we're going to have to leave it right there. You're watching the beat. We'll be right back. There seems to be a new wave of aggressive driving lately. You see those people, they are the ones that are tailgating other people because they have to get through their destination now. Weaving in and out of traffic looks like they could care less about who's around them. There's no one else on the roadway. They're the only one there. Aggressive driving can be the difference between life and death. All because somebody thought they needed to be the front of the line and get there first. Slow down. Don't be the reason that someone else doesn't go home tonight. My dog Jupiter is frightened. When I climb too high, the owl said. Check for monsters, Daddy. I did, honey. There are no monsters. You're perfectly safe. Protect yourself and those you love. Vaccinate now. Welcome back to the B, the voice of Alabama politics. Okay, now this <laughs> this one goes off into the realm of the bizarre. You yeah. know, 
we all like a good, a good bizarre uh, report. We do. We like it. But I mean, with this one, just Josh, you, you and I were talking about this, and Susan and I were talking about this, and this is one of the crazier stories that we've ever covered. I have to say, at, at least in my mind. Mm -hmm. So here's here's the crux of it. Uh, Representative Ed Oliver. I remember him from the CRT sexualizing children days as all right, well. Okay. Uh, anyway, Representative Ed Oliver during the uh, early days of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, had some questions for the uh, Alabama Department of Veterans Affairs. What had happened was at the uh, Bill Nichols uh, Veterans Home uh, in, uh, up, up in Alexander City, they were hit particularly hard. All the VA homes were hit particularly mm -hmm. hard yes, because you had elderly population in those homes. These are men and women who have fought for our country, served in peacetime, given their lives in a lot of respect for their country, and now they're in their waning years. Uh, so they got hit hard. Mm -hmm. Representative Oliver, you know, called over to the VA and had, was, had some questions. And first off, he asked, did they have enough hand sanitizer at the Bill Nickel facility? And they said, well, let us check. We'll find out. Turns out, well, he said he had information that no hand exactly no hand yes, sanitizer. I was about to say that no hand sanitizer. They had 120 gallons. Yes, that's quite a bit. So then he called back and he said, "Well, and this is a few you know weeks later." He says, "Well, my sources tell me that you, you know Bill Nichols has no PPEs, and that's the personal uh, 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 protection, protection equipment. equipment. Have none." And they said, "Well, we will check." And they did an inventory, and lo and behold, Mr. Oliver's information was absolutely wrong. They had over 400 mm -hmm. PPEs on hand. Then time goes by, Tim comes by, and then he becomes enraged, outraged, because his sources, and we get this straight from people who were present multiple at the event, sources. multiple services at the event, his sources said that a nurse at the Bill Nichols Veterans Home in Alexander City, Josh, was administering lethal doses of medication to kill people as a part of a cover-up. Um, My thoughts exactly. No, I, if somebody came up to you on the street and told you this, you know, there's a good chance that you would try to find some sort of institution for them. Um, and, and it's it, because it's, I guess it's part, maybe it's part of the, the, the Fox News brain rot uh, where you know, we, we've just inundated people with so much misinformation now that they can't tell the difference. And, and I think that's what uh, Representative Oliver is suffering from here where he's just taking information and he's just regurgitating it. No matter how ridiculous or absurd it is, he's just buying it because I guess maybe it fits some sort of a narrative that that he wants to believe in. I, I but I don't even know what that narrative would be necessarily. I mean, Susan, this was investigated mm -hmm. by the attorney general's office. It was we wasted money and time on this. Yeah. This is that's not, you. You went right to my point on that. The thing that really outrages me is that he wasted all the time. Everybody remembers what it was like during COVID with our health providers in a struggle to try to keep up with everything, to try to keep everybody healthy, to try to do it. And he had the audacity, not once, but three times to go to that nursing home and have those employees stop and do inventory of hand sanitizer. Yeah, stop I'm and do inventory of PPEs. You know, that's just what did he insane. Think? What did he think that they were doing? I mean, that they just, they didn't have any hand sanitizer and they were just okay with it? I mean, I, you know, they were, I, I don't know. I, that's that's what I don't understand. What what did his injecting himself into this equation to ask these questions and cause the problem, what what was that going to solve? And, and, and it solved nothing except you had several investigations, you know, the Department of uh, the Alabama Department of Veterans Affairs sent us a, a, uh, a an email uh, and said that yes, what we had asked about was true, mm -hmm. that Representative Oliver had 
said these things and that he, in fact, all these things were investigated. Now, here's the real kicker. Ed Oliver has been appointed as the chairperson mm -hmm. over the House Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. And I can tell you, the veterans that are sitting on the board mm -hmm. of the Veterans Affairs of Alabama are very concerned, at least the ones that we know of, are very concerned that this man, who seems to uh, have a conspiratorial mindset, that he's going to be over seeing the programs, the money, this type of thing that might go to our veterans who served in war and peace. And don't, let's not forget here how condescending he was to all of these people. That is our And, and how he talked down to them and talked over them. And we're talking about people that when he was in the military were higher rank than he was. Yeah. Uh, and he had the audacity to be, you know, just off-putting and, and, and condescending to these folks. Yeah, I, I, Alabama's uh, Veterans Affairs head is a was an admiral in the U.S. Navy, probably higher rank than a helicopter pilot, which is what uh, Oliver was. Oliver was. Mm -hmm. But Josh, yeah. just like Susan brought up before, this is a man who has a conspiracy theory about a lot of things, and he has misinformation. Yeah about a gross amount of things. Yeah, you know, this is this is something that, that, that I am hopeful that the leadership, uh, you know, there with, with Ledbetter uh, will, will kind of root out are these, these type of people being in charge of, of committees and things that, that you know, you've got to, you've got to demonstrate some level of competency, uh, just, just basic level competency. I, I don't have to agree with you. We don't have to agree on things, but you can't, you, you can't be doing things like this. You can't be fooled so easily uh, by just the most absurd thing. I mean, I think about what we're talking about here, that, that we have somebody killing veterans at a veteran's home, and, and they're calling over and, and demand. He's having to call over and demand uh, an investigation from the AG's office because they're not doing anything about it. I mean, that's, a, that's quite an insult to these people, to the good people that yeah. are running these places, that are trying their best during a global pandemic to keep f the very vulnerable people that they can care for safe it's it's a you know it really is a black eye and, and i hope you know i listen i just get it together ed come on man well let's hope that that there is something done but for now that's where we are we have to leave it right there you're watching the be the voice of alabama politics we'll be right back Throughout my career, I've seen many crashes, and a lot of the fatalities are from people who haven't worn their seatbelt. Cars have rolled over multiple times. I've had people end up in lakes, um, ravines. I've been looking for people in the woods for a couple hours before. Usually just about every bone in their body is broken, their organs have ruptured, and typically they die. You want to save a life, just simply click a button and put the seatbelt on. Seatbelts really do save lives. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Speed is one of the biggest factors in a fatal car crash. Your car stops, but your body does not stop at the same time. Your body keeps going, you know, and that could be running into your seat belt, that could be hitting the airbag, something has to stop it, and unfortunately it's something very hard. <laughs> there have been times that we've come upon accidents where if people weren't speeding, they'd probably still be alive today. It's truly dangerous and it puts everybody at risk. There's just no point to it. This kind of stuff has got to stop. Welcome back to the V, the voice of Alabama politics. Josh, you, you sent me, uh, this was a national article that you sent me, and then later on it was followed up on. And I, You know, when I read it, I thought it was something out of the onion. I thought it was a spoof, because I didn't even think that the Attorney General of Alabama, Steve Marshall, could be as heartless and as as just mean-spirited as he actually is. And this is the guy who thinks he should be governor one day. 
Never mm -hmm. going to happen. But what Marshall has done under the, uh, the anti-abortion law, we won't get into the mm -hmm. euphemism they call it, under the anti-abortion law, there is no prosecution of women. There's no prosecution of women whatsoever. However, Marshall says that doesn't matter because any woman that takes an abortion pill or anything like that is going to be prosecuted by him under the Chemical Endangerment Act. I mean, Josh, I couldn't believe that this spineless man is so heartless as to go after women like he is. Well, you know, I I think that um, that sometimes Steve Marshall forgets that other people can hear or read the words that he says to these conservative sites. Uh, you know, he goes on these things because he's trying to beef up his conservative credentials and, uh, you know, because he's got to run far to the right of, of I guess, he, he's going to run against Will Ainsworth in a few years for governor or some, some spot. And so, you know, he, he's got to set himself up far right of that. And so he, he throws out these things that I don't think he even considers. You know, he did it earlier this year when he talked about uh, using Alabama's accessory laws in order to prosecute the, the folks that might assist somebody in going to, to receive an abortion in a state where abortion is legal, to which a, a judge, a circuit court judge, actually said to me, so let me get this straight. You're going to try to put me in jail for driving my wife to Tunica to gamble? Uh, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know what I'm saying? It's absurd. It's that level of absurdity. And this is the kind of the same way. I think Chris England, uh, Representative Chris England, called it uh, BS, uh, although he used the full phrase. Uh, and, you know, I, it just, the, this is not what ke the Chemical Endangerment Act was meant to do. These are legal prescriptions that are sent to people. And what really touched this off is uh, the Food and Drug Administration this past week determined that uh, now, brick-and-mortar pharmacies, regular pharmacies, can distribute the two most popular uh, abortion pills. Um, and also, the Department of Justice ruled that, that with that being the case, uh, those you can now have those things mailed to you. Uh, and so if you go, let's say, for example, you go on a televisit, a telehealth visit, which I think we've all done at this point, uh, yes. and, and you get a doctor in Colorado or, you know, New York uh, somewhere, uh, and you tell them what, what's going on and they prescribe this medication for you, uh, it can be mailed to your house legally. Um, and so now Steve Marshall wants to, in some way, find out about that and attempt to prosecute you for the medical decisions uh, that you're making at home and the legal medication that you are, are ingesting yourself. So I, I just, man, it, it just is a, I don't think they can do it, first of all. And secondly, I think it's just another tactic to kind of scare the hell out of women and leave them in some sort of flux over this sort of thing and under the guise of it seeming as though Marshall is doing something about this abortion stuff, you know? Yeah. That, and it's, and it's, it's abhorrent. Well, we know things about Marshall and this kind of thing mm -hmm. that he doesn't want to come to light. He's not nearly as conservative on some of these issues as he'd like to think when he's got his, his eye on the next higher office, which is governor. Uh, he, what is he going to do? Is he going to tap people's phones? Is he going to tap their computers? Is he going to fall? Exactly how is he going to figure out? This is nothing more than grandstanding, which he is wonderfully good at doing, not actually getting his job done. He doesn't even show up to the office most of the time. I mean, to me, this is not about whether you are uh, pro-choice or no. pro-life. This is about the decency of an individual life and about what is legal for an individual to do. And Marshall and I hate to overuse this, would really be comfortable in somewhere like a, 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 a Taliban state where women are, are subjugated to second class. He would be just as comfortable there as he would be in any type of totalitarian government because the only thing he really cares about is his own career. He yeah, doesn't and, care you know, about people. And that's, you know, I think that to me is, is one of the worst things here is, is, is that, you know, I know people that know Steve Marshall and, and they, you know, they think of him as a, as a decent person. And, um, and, and so it, it, it is concerning to me that somebody that other people, other people who I respect, who think of him as a decent person, uh, that, that he would behave in this way simply to further his own political career that he would he would be willing to throw women under the bus like that um it just 
just to do that. And, and that's concerning to me. But, you know, I, I just this whole thing has got to has gone far enough. This is not a popular right. topic. This is not a popular we, thing. It's not something to play around with. We have seen Steve Marshall, both in his personal life and in his professional life, treatment of women that bring some of this into yeah. you know, what we're talking about here with him believing in the Taliban state. This is something we've observed. I, I, he would be very, very comfortable in Afghanistan with the new regime there. I, I don't say that lightly. I say that because he is a person that doesn't mind subjugating other people as long as it gives him more power. I do want to go to another, and this, this, this man's death was a while back, but the family of Albert Jackson Sorrells uh, just released the fact that uh, he was a prisoner in Alabama. Mm -hmm. He died. Uh, we don't know all the circumstances around his death, but he died in his cell or in his bed, uh, in his bunk. And when they finally found him, he was decomposing, Josh. I just, I mean, again, it's back to the same thing that we continue to talk about with the prison system. And the number one issue that we have is staffing, all right? It's been staffing. It's going to continue to be staffing. It's, the, it's both in the number of guards and correctional officers that are being paid to work in places and in the amount of money that they're being paid to work in those places. We could have very easily taken a chunk of this money and devoted it to, instead of building mega prisons, we could have devoted it to this issue, to, to paying these guys more, to making sure that they were trained better, to making sure that there were more of them, and to making sure that they were, they were able to control an environment that made them feel safe and, and made the job better and more attractive to more people. And we're, we, we're not going to do it. We're, we're well, simply not going to do it. And as a result of that, we have situations where human beings that are supposed to be under our care are decomposing because nobody even knew that they were dead. Unfortunately, that's going to have to be the last word. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You watch us because we watch them.